Hi, this is the Lone Wolf and Pack Show right here on Witchcraft TV. And if you didn't know any better, or if you didn't know, or you need to know on a need to know basis, it's www.witchcrafttv.online. And we're glad to have you, and we're doing great and doing great things for the community for a 100% free um, pagan television station. Um, but for now, we're broadcasting from Louisville, Kentucky, and over in Kansas, I think Wichita, we have Munastera. Munastera, how are you? I'm doing wonderful. We got rid of the rain, and I heard it's over your way today. I don't mind the rain, but it is kind of dreary here this weekend. And I'm really glad that we're here um, spitting and talking. Uh, and we're going to be talking to a pagan musician. Is that right? Yes, she is a wonderful musician. She plays a whistle and um, is Teapot Pankhurst, if I pronounce it correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yep, Pankhurst is fine. Uh, thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. Welcome to the Lone Wolf Show and Pack Show, um, Witchcraft TV. Um, glad to have you on. How long have you been pagan? How long have you been, pl been playing music as a pagan? Is it, is it go hand in hand? Is that a thing? Okay. Yeah, that's a bit of a story. Um, actually, first of all, I kind of, I mean, I guess my spiritual path really started just before I moved to the United States. I was more on a sort of left hand path kind of thing. Uh, both me and my husband, we met through um, the Satanic Temple. I'm sure you know who they are. Um, but I kind of drifted away from left hand path and just kind of like left it like in the air for a while. And I didn't really uh, do much with spiritual stuff for a while. Um, and then in 2020, I really just started to feel insanely homesick and uh, decided that I wanted to kind of do something in my life that was going to bring some of my culture over to the United States. And uh, also at the time, me and my husband, we were getting evicted from our apartment and we were about to be moving into an RV. And at the time, I was a huge gamer and I really needed some hobbies that, had, you know, didn't involve any electricity or, you know, because I knew that that's what we were going to end up with, no electricity and all of that. So I decided in 2020 to spend $10 on a, on a, on a tin whistle and, uh, and then just started like playing music. Um, and then I got I got on TikTok and then, you know, I kind of got quite popular on there. Um, and I really started just originally just doing um, traditional music, usually from Ireland and Scotland um, and a little bit from England. They're all quite interconnected anyway. Um, so I was doing quite a lot of trad, but I never really felt like I fitted in. Um, and then really just last year, it was about 18 months ago, I really started to look into sort of the pagan roots. Um, of where I'm from and all of that. And then it really felt like the missing puzzle piece that brought a lot of things together. And all of a sudden I just sort of like took off more with music and started still like incorporating traditional stuff, you know, in traditional styles, um, but we're creating my own like reels and, uh, and jigs and hornpipes um, along with using pagan lyrics. And actually a lot of my practice um, and my deity work really is creative stuff um so most of what i do is reverence for uh, my deities now do you think picking up the whistles helped you connect with that pagan side and lead you there you know what i think it all really yeah i think some of that definitely and then i'm also quite heavily into like mutual aid and activism and stuff like that so i just reckon it just all sort of came together in that sort of way um so, yeah, I, I would say so. Um, I think that, you know, those the, the music, the, the Irish and Scottish and some English traditional folk stuff, it all comes from the roots of that, you know. So it's, it's really quite um, easy to sort of connect it together. Um, and if you look at like a lot of the older songs as well, you know, um, you can you can see it. You can you can really see it. Even the ones that have quite Christianized lyrics these days, a lot of the time, the lyrics have been changed over the years. Things have gone from major to minor, and there's lots of different variations of songs as well. Have you played your flute at any festivals? Have you tried that yet? Like performing? Um, so 
the, okay, so at the beginning of this year, I really started to sort of dip my toes into playing live. Um, it is kind of difficult because I, no matter how much I've tried to find people around here to play with, I've found it quite difficult. Um, so I knew that with the kind of things that I wanted to play, uh, it's also kind of difficult because um, the whistles that I use only play one scale. They'll play a major scale. So you really, you know, when you rock up at drum circles, you kind of have to take that into consideration. And also each whistle has its own key. So it's not just something that fits into like every single piece of music. Um, they're usually only really played with traditional songs, um, which mostly are in that kind of in one scale. Um, but yeah, I did decide that I was going to start um, making my own tracks. So when I started to do that, I did look into doing some performances and I'm trying to think like where, where it really started. Oh yeah, I got asked to do um, a Beltane with Sin City Witches. Um, so yeah, that was like probably the first performance I'd done live. And then I did the, I did a summer solstice as well um, at Container Park here in Las Vegas. I did the summer solstice festival there. And then I did the Samhain Soiree uh, here in town. Um, I've also done quite a lot of online stuff, like conferences and stuff like that. So I did, um, I was I was brought on to be the solar punk musician for the solar punk conference at the beginning of this year, which is really cool. And then next week I will be playing Sin City Witches, which was party, which um, is at the space this year. But definitely if you, um, if you wanna know more about that, definitely check that out on the Sin City Witches website. Yeah, I think that's how I ran into you is through the Sin City Witches. Yeah, probably. Yeah, because, uh, you know, they're very community based people. I love I love everything that they do. And they, you know, it's really strange because I guess like a lot of people, when they think of Las Vegas, they think of the strip. I mean, when I moved here, I didn't ever expect there to be this kind of um, occult scene, you know, and it wasn't something I was technically looking for i mean like we weren't we did not plan to be here as long as we have been here we had seriously a few days and just somehow everything sort of fell into place and if there's one thing i can say about las vegas it's got very shape-shifting energy um you know it will change you like and you'll see it like you know i've never seen a place that changes so much um but yeah there is a lot of like occult people here um and just great people great vibes um a lot of community um, so yeah, it's just not all about the strip. There is a lot more and a lot, a lot of people are moving here. A lot of people are moving here, which is also very refreshing as well. Yes. So what brought you to the U S? Oh, okay. Well, that's, <laughs> that's a story as well. Um, so I was at the time I was living, um, in Plymouth, you know, like when you look back at things and you're like, gosh, I wish I'd taken advantage of this. I can't believe that I lived less than an hour away from that witchcraft museum in Cornwall that everyone talks about that everyone wants to go to and I never went but anyway <laughs> anyway that just means you have to go back yeah I know right um it's I t I'm not from Plymouth I'm from um an area called Newbury um which is about maybe an hour and a half from London um closest city is Reading but anyway at the time I was living in Plymouth I really didn't have a lot going on um and I started speaking, me, like I said, I met my husband through um, left-hand path connections. You know, we had a ton of mutuals and all of that. So uh, we just started talking. And then um, I guess just after the election, when all of that weird stuff was happening with, you know, are they letting people in the country? Are they not? You know, that kind of thing. We just sort of jumped on it and was like, let's just get you over here. And I just stayed. Honestly, that's it. And we got married and that's just kind of it, really. So, yeah. And now we're kind of just... Um, now we're living in a, uh, you know, we're travelers, we travel around. And uh, that part of our life has been really awesome. Like we stayed in Dallas for like three, three or four years. And like I said, we got, um, we got evicted and then we started traveling and that's just been amazing. So yeah, there are a lot of things I do love about the US. Um, you know, I don't want to be a citizen. I, uh, you know, the UK will always be my home and at some point I will go back, but I'm not, be I, I do not feel like I'm being called back yet. So. So where's the next, next place you want to go um, check out in the US? Oh, you know what? Probably if we have to stay here for a while, because like I said, my husband's not been very well. Um, so, you know, he had a he had a sudden cardiac arrest um, in October. Oh, no. It was really, really out of nowhere. Um, he had uh, it was just we were here at the trailer and he just fell to the floor and uh, he actually died seven times in October. Oh, so wow. it was 
been very very sick um but he has made a really good recovery it's like really strange because they uh they in the hospital they were kind of calling it a bit of a miracle he's like one of the first people they've ever had that's gone from the icu straight home like that's how well his recovery's been but they want to run like a ton of tests on him to find out why this happened because they don't know so we're probably going to be here another summer <laughs> which i really didn't want to be just because i do struggle with the heat but and that's the only thing um, but probably on our next sort of journey, if I could choose where we go, I would really like to be somewhere where it's a little bit less car centric and spaced out. But we never really have a plan. So, you know, honestly, a lot of the time we just wing it. So I couldn't yeah. tell you. I mean, Oregon looks nice, you know. <laughs> I think maybe yeah. maybe that, you know, it really depends where's, where's traveler friendly these days, where we could put an yeah. RV, that thing, what comes in our direction, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So what's a penny whistle look like? Okay, so I have some examples. So um, just some background, penny whistle and tin whistle are the same thing. I know I always get this, like, what's the difference? They are the same thing. The reason they're called a tin whistle is because they used to be made out of tin. And the reason called a penny whistle is because they used to be sold for a penny. I believe I'm right on that. Now, what is interesting mm -hmm. about is that um, they are actually originally from England. I know a lot of people call them the Irish penny whistle, but they actually were originally in England first, but they were used, I think, towards a different kind of music style than what we hear um, in Irish traditional music, stuff like reels and jigs. Um, so they kind of looked like this at the beginning. Um, this is like an E. So they were very, very small. Um, this one's actually made out of PVC, um, but the, the traditional ones were made out of tin. Um, but this is what you would call a high whistle because they now make several variations of this um now they're not the same as the irish flute the irish flute you play on the side like a regular flute so these are still whistles although honestly i do just prefer to call them magic flutes so <laughs> that's kind of but yeah i'll give you like a demonstration of what a high whistle sounds like if i miss some of these notes it's because i'm really i don't play high whistles very often um for several reasons um and one of them is my cat really hates them <laughs> so what is where because the finger difference is so much that like, my fingers are so used to being further apart. So uh, I'll give it a go. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's probably the highest. I mean, you can get, so this is an E. You can get a G and you can get an F, but yeah, it's it's bad. <laughs> um, anything higher than that, key wise. But traditionally, usually it's a D. Um, I don't actually have a D with me today, um, but that's kind of just like the smaller size ones you get. And then the ones that I really enjoy playing the most are um, the alto whistles. The ones that are kind of in between. Um, so you'll get keys like this will be like an A um, and then a B flat. Um, will be an alto whistle as well anything sort of down to like i mean you, technically i guess it's, um, you, you can get them um but yeah they're, they're sort of like in in the middle um now my favorite style really for me now this varies from, from person to person so you know you'll hear a bunch of people who play these say different things but i do prefer to have a pvc mouthpiece and an aluminum body i like the aluminum bodies because they give off like a really nice tone but PVC mouthpiece is better than an aluminum mouthpiece because aluminum clogs all of the time. Um, so you really have to warm the whistles up. Um, condensation is a huge problem. Even though they do technically sound like beautiful, condensation is a big problem. I used to exclusively play Kerry whistles. So this is like a, this is one with a aluminum mouthpiece. Um, and this one does all right. But if you go any bigger than this, like you'll end up with condensation issues. And uh, some people seem to be all right with it. It uh, annoys me, so. <laughs> um, yeah. But this one is an Alto A. I haven't had this one very long. This is a Tony Dixon, and actually these are very budget friendly. I believe this one may have been under 100. Um, and they usually range from, you can get like a, a real budget tin whistle from Amazon for about $13. And a lot of people say don't get them. But honestly, there's a place for them, and that place is for learning. And I would always say just like don't even invest in it unless you know you're gonna like actually stick with it and if you can make that sound great 
then you can make anything above that mm. sound great as well, if that makes sense. You know, I just don't understand why people just go straight and buy like a like a carbony, which is like five hundred dollars off the bat, you know, like yeah. you'll just spend thirteen. But I mean most of them range around the price of like a hundred to a hundred and fifty. That's kind of like, you know, the budget that I think is like a semi professional whistle. And they are tunable as well. So you can take um the top of that. And then depending where you put it, you could slide it like up and down to sort of fine tune it for playing with other people. Um, but yeah, this one's this one's in A, so. So do you ever find yourself writing lyrics with that flute? Um, sorry, say that one more time. Do you, do you ever write? Do you write lyrics with the flute, or is it separate? Yeah. So um, usually what I do is I will write. Um, I, it really depends. Like sometimes I do like spiritual exercises with them. Like I'll I'll start with just like taking some deep breaths. And I'll just sit there and I'll do some deep breaths and then like I'll be like, right, or with this one deep breath, I'm just going to hum out a random tune right? and I'll just hum it out to myself. And then I'll take another deep breath and then I'll try and like, you know, fine tune it into something that's a little bit more readable. And then before I know it, I've got some sort of melody going now because I've done a lot of rad music, a lot of what I do kind of really falls into i mostly go towards like horn pipes because that's already kind of the the um timing of those so it's already in my head so um so anyway i just i, I come to a melody and then what i'll do is i'll find a whistle to play it on and usually it works out and then i'll record that because otherwise i'll forget it so i'll do a really crappy recording of it um and then i'll try and work on it and then usually like the way that um traditional music is is that you'll have like part one and part two, sometimes a part three. Um, so I'll do the first part um, and then I'll try and do a second part as well. Um, so I, I'll try and do that. And then if I add lyrics to it, um, then I'll work around that as well. Adding lyrics is something that I've only been really toying with recently. Um, so, cause I'm not like, I wouldn't say I'm a bad singer. I'm just, I'm someone who doesn't really, you know, use my vocals that often. So I'm still like practicing singing, getting good at singing. I used to sing a lot when I was at school. Um, in fact, actually I grew up Protestant and I was, believe it or not, a top soprano at one point. I can't even believe, I mean, today we were at the UU and they they got these songs on that are so high pitched that I'm like, how did I do that? Like, I don't even know. Um, but yeah. That's kind of just like where it sort of ended with me with the vocals, but I'm starting to pick it back up again now because I've realised I do actually quite like writing the lyrics. Um, and one of the ones that I really was quite proud of was I did um, a reverence to uh, Nima Tonga, who's the goddess of sacred groves. Not much is known about her, um, but what, what we do know is that the Druids, um, you know, obviously we know they didn't really make spaces. They kind of did their... Um, Rich was out in out in the woods. You know, they didn't really have altars or anything as much. It was all in groves. Um, and so I kind of wanted to do do an offering for her that was something that wasn't going to have an impact on the environment, if that makes sense. So um, that's a lot of the reason why I've chosen to do this stuff um, as offerings as well. What's now, who do you look up to as a musician? Oh gosh. Um, Oh, you know, I haven't really thought about, okay, so I grew up listening to a lot of folk music through my mum and dad. I've been to a ton of folk festivals in the UK. Um, so I'd probably say, although I've never had the pleasure of seeing Ian Anderson live, I would definitely say Jeff Rotol, um has had a huge influence on my life. Um, and I know that he plays, he plays like a conventional classical fruit, but flute. Um, but yeah, he, he definitely him say a lot of the folk singers around the 1970s um you had bands like fair Court convention that had sandy denny um anyone who was kind of part of that um folk revival um that they had in the 70s where a lot of folk rock bands took um these child ballads from a long time ago you know and made them into songs and told these stories because that's one thing i'm really interested in as well is telling stories 
through music. Um, so yeah, I would say from that era, definitely. And then I also, I really love what's sort of coming out um, of the modern trads scene right now, um, which is totally unconventional. And there's a lot of bands that are successfully doing it right now, mixing electronic music in with traditional music. There's, for example, a really awesome band from the Outer Hebrides, they're called Face the West. Um, and then there's Project Smoke as well. They do, um, they mix electronic music, usually with penny whistles, and it's amazing. I mean, they're, they're people I look up to, they are very advanced players, um, and they play a lot faster than I'm ever going to be able to do, and I know that because I'm just not crazy enough to uh, <laughs> to play that fun. <laughs> But it is, it's just fascinating. It's just mind-blowingly amazing. Um, so I, in some of my songs, like on the recent EP that I have done, which is The Face of the Crone, the second song on there is an electronic track. Um, so I do I do sometimes incorporate electronic music in with um, my stuff as well. So it's not so just- That album was called The Face of the Crow? Uh, the, uh, the Face of the Crone. The Face of the Crone. Crone, yes, yes. And uh, you can find that, um, it's free to download on my Bandcamp right now. I like to make everything sort of accessible if I can. So it's free to download on Bandcamp. Um, and there's also like, what I really I really like Bandcamp. They do that whole pay what you can thing as well. So if you wanted to leave a tip or a donation, that's totally fine as well. But yeah, you can download it if you just to leave. What's your Sorry. What is your spirituality? Spiritual. Okay. So um, honestly, I don't, I, I would just say, I kind of just call it earth-based spiritualism. You know, um, most of my practice is very nature-based. Um, a lot of the stuff that I do is outside in nature. Um, and then the, the deities that I um, are drawn towards are, are ones that are sort of more local to where I'm from. Um, so I really love Kanunos uh, and Nematonio, who I mentioned before as well, um, and Andres Day, who I'm who I'm just working with now, um, is another one. But then also like the Kaliak as well. You know, we're writing this one about um, the winter crone. I've really felt like a, a connection of really, really um, like I had to do a lot of uh, research about what the crone represents. And uh, that just really, really brought it to me, you know, this time of year. And I, I seem to have this kind of like um, more um, special feeling about you than I thought I was going to, you know, just from just from this song that I did. Monica, you got something? You got a question? Um, so do you consider yourself a bard? Okay. Um, no, I, <laughs> yes, I do. You know, um, in fact, actually here in Las Vegas, I do want to get a Bardic Circle um, set up because I really want us to have a place where we can really celebrate creativity that's in a non-judgmental space. So nobody feels like they have to get up on stage and, you know, like it's none of that. Like, because I know that performing live, like even I really struggle with it. Um, and I don't know if people can pick that up, but I've really had to throw myself out there with live performances. Like I am an extrovert, but it is intimidating being out there. And I did kind of throw myself in at the deep end in some of these situations, <laughs> you know, performing to people who are not pagans, performing to people, you know, one I did at summer solstice, I remember just like looking at the lineup and I was the only one that wasn't a rapper. And I was like, oh no, like, you know, this is gonna be so weird to everyone. Um, and I was so nervous. And that's the thing I've had to really, really work on um, being able to perform and uh, not be like terrified. But I think just having that um, that middle ground for people to be able to experiment with creativity, but not feel like they're in an intimidating space um, would be a really good thing for this area. So it would be a little bit more, it would be like an open mic night, but it would be in a, like a circular form. Um, so I really want to get that going in Las Vegas. We have been talking about it. It's just, oh, it just seems to be back to back at this time of year. Uh, at the moment, you know, you go from, you go from uh, Samhain and then you go straight into Yule and it's just, yeah. So it's probably going to be something that we're going to be working on um, more towards January. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something that I do. I do consider myself a bard. Um, I love 
I, I love Dandelion from The Witcher, who to me is just like the bard. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, I would definitely. And, and then, you know, obviously I love David Bard, you know, he's cool as well. Drew Cast is amazing, so. Now you are also an artist. I'd seen some of your drawings. Tell me a bit more about that. Oh yes, yeah. So I do. I, that's the thing. Like I just call myself Mrs. Creative at the end of the day because it is. It's just that's my whole thing. I am just the creative, um, full time, really. <laughs> um, and I'm I'm very privileged to have a life where I can. I do have the time to do things like that. And in all fairness, art has been more. Um, more in my life than music has over the years. Music has kind of been something that I've been exploring with and has really been taken off in the, since 2020, but art has always been there for me. Like I, uh, I know how to tattoo. I was a tattoo artist as well. Um, but uh, my husband now does that here in Las Vegas. Um, it's too stressful if we both do it. It's just long hours. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, I've, I've done a bit, a bit of that. Um, but yeah, yeah, I do. At the moment, I'm sort of getting into a little bit of digital art, um, which I'd never done before. And I honestly just thought it would be just like traditional drawing and it's absolutely not. And I have so much, great, I have so much respect for anybody who, um, who is a digital artist because it's its own game it really is um but yeah i do like to experiment i mean most of the time i'm doing little things for my altar like i've probably i can show you this one right now because well, i've got my altar right next to me it's a good thing about living in a camp where everything's like yeah. you know bones throw away but this one i did um which is uh loose hands holding oh, nice. the old um, and that's on brown paper but that is just with crayons so yeah, yeah I just I love little it. things and stuff like that but yeah i usually have a music project going an art project going and then some sort of textile thing whether it's like you know making hats or making a waistcoat or something you know because i uh one of one of the jobs that i do is i clean a laundrette so we tend to get a lot of people leaving things and never coming back to them and i hate throwing things away you know a lot of my uh earth-based spiritual stuff is i really care <laughs> about mm -hmm. uh, waste and uh, you know it's 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 hard in this country. It really is. Um, and I'm currently not in a position where I can recycle, um, but I can do little things like you know recycle some of the textiles that get left in the laundry and stuff like that. So, mm. yeah, I understand that. I'm a I'm an artist too, and I create all different kinds with different mediums. And I'm trying. I'm just now starting to try my hand at tattooing. My son is an artist, and he's kind of been coaching me a little bit um on that and i did a few on myself and gonna start trying to do others um but what's your tip on um tattooing oh okay um honestly i mean it really depends uh as, as tips go honestly it's i feel like the industry is really struggling right now if i'm honest um i feel like the you know we had that bubble of um the uh, tattoo shows on the television where everybody went tattoo mad for a while and uh, was getting tattoos, tattoos, tattoos. Hang on one second. Babe, can you answer the door? Sorry. <laughs> uh, my door never, my no, no one ever knocks on my door. Um, anyway, I would say that the, uh, um, that, that, kind of, that bubble's kind of bursting a little bit um, at the moment. So, and it seems to be quite an oversaturated market in big cities. I don't know about, um, about smaller ones. Um, but yeah, I would say honestly that like, if you can build up your own clientele, get get in with the pagans, you know, because I think yeah. a lot of people, a lot of people that I meet are like, oh, I just don't know who to go to, and that's the thing. And what I will say out there is just people watching about tattooing, be careful of what you see on Instagram because yeah, just the unrealistic expectations of what people Photoshop is like not what you're gonna get a lot of the time. Um, if yeah. you were to check. For example, my husband's page, he never photoshops his work, but a lot of people do. And so mm. it just creates this, like, you know, unrealistic thing. So, uh, yeah. but yeah, so, you know, um, if you're good at drawing, then you'll make a really good tattoo artist. Because honestly, there are more bad tattoo artists out there than good. I have to say that, you know, there are more people mm. that are interested in the money side of it than they are in the art. And if you've got a passion for art and you can draw, which you have, then you'll be fine. And people will yeah. see that. You can make these connections with people and you know you're already an, an interviewer you know you you've got people skills that really helps as well you know yeah. 
Yeah, so I um, love your flutes too. And I have some, my cousin's a flute player. He plays this type and I have a few of them, but it's just, when I heard your flute, when I heard the penny whistle, it's just, some, it did something to me. So I would like to pick one up. Maybe I'll get the $14 one from Amazon, try it out. But I'm definitely going to yeah, do that. I appreciate you sharing information on that. If I could give you, because uh, there will be like several manufacturers um, that do sell through Amazon or like, I mean, I think Walmart, you know, sadly, I, I know that I'm sitting there saying Amazon after I said all this stuff about like, you know, caring about the planet. But sadly, I mean, you're just not going to find a tin whistle in the US at a music shop. You're just not. Um, you know, I mean, we are we're lucky we have Lark in the Morning in California, but they in fact, actually, I would check out them lark in the morning before you go to Amazon if you can, because I believe they do have some budgets on there. Um, and they do so. They, I believe the shipping's pretty quick. Um, so I've bought from them a few times. Um, but yeah, I would say definitely if you can get like a Clark, a Clark's a good one or a Fee Dog. Um, they, they're both budget ones. Um, but the number one that I wanted to show you guys actually is this one. And I got this one quite recently. And I know it's very big in comparison to the other ones. Um, I got this one for my birthday this year. And this one is called a Nightingale. Um, that's the, the, the make of it. Um, it is made by a guy in Russia who uh, it's really hard to get them right now because of the war. And uh, it took a long time to find this one. So I'm not sure if they are around much anymore. Um, but this is honestly my favorite one and it just gives off that kind of low tone. So I'm going to try and do it so I can get the whole one in. But And uh, this one's in an E, so you can get them bigger than this, um, but you'll find um, on the bottom hand, especially if you're like me and you've got insanely tiny hands. If I could change anything about myself, it would be the size of my hands because it'd be so much easier to play these bigger ones. Um, but yeah. you have to do something called the piper's grip, which actually has nothing to do with piping or bagpipes. In fact, most most people who play bagpipes are like, I would never hold my pipes like that. I don't even know why it's called that. <laughs> you have to move your fingers, so I'm going to show you. Um, in a direction that's a bit like that to fit your fingers all over the holes. Mm -hmm. um, more with the sort of real padded area, almost to your knuckles, to try and get to those um, those lower notes. And if you were to, so this is a E. If you were to get a D, it would be a bigger stretch, and then you can get a C. I haven't got a C because um, I just know I wouldn't be able to make the stretch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I so, got yeah. smaller hands too, and I find it difficult with you know playing chords on the guitar. It's very difficult, so yeah. I'm gonna start learning the bass. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel you with the guitar thing as well. Like, I mean, that F chord, you're like, no, like it's just yeah. Oh, like, yeah. As far as that, I'm like, no, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I like to pluck. So I'm gonna um um actually some a uh, guitar. Uh, manufacturer and someone that restores them um, is starting a business and he's going to um, create me a guitar. So I'm excited. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, wow. Is that an acoustic then you're going to get? Um, he does electric guitars, but he's going to put something special in it and it can switch to be like an acoustic also. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's what yeah. you want. Yeah. Yeah. I have an yeah. electric acoustic. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know how long it's going to take, but I'm patiently waiting. <laughs> We're yeah. in the planning stages right now. Anyone that makes makes musical instruments, you know, it's just the they have to be so passionate about it. Like all the ones I've shown you today are handmade and they all come from, I believe the guy who makes this one, he doesn't do them anymore, um, but he actually was in Missouri. Um, mm. But yeah, he's, he's very passionate about it. So I got, um, and then... This one uh, is a Kerry whistle, like I said earlier, and this is made by a guy called Phil Hardy in the UK. It's actually called a busker because this model is um, what buskers in the UK use. Because you can you can busk more in the UK than you can here. I feel like the laws around it here are just so so backwards, um, you know, and and just uh, it annoys me. It annoys me so much. But. Yeah, the laws are different everywhere for busking. Some places are cool and some places not, huh, Harold? 
Gosh, yeah, no, here in Vegas, it's ridiculous. It really is. I mean, like they, they've given us a little space. Um, if you've been to Vegas and you've probably been to Fremont Experience where they've got those circles and they say that oh, yeah. that's, that's where we've all got to busk. Well, if you've been down there, then you'll know that you would be competing with like 40 different sound systems. Mm. And, mm. Uh, and it's also got, it's pretty dodgy these days. Um, it's definitely not the sort of environment that I would want to do. I have... I have dipped my toes in a bit of busking in the arts district on a day I think I can get away with it. But yeah, you're really like supposed to uh, supposed to only be in those circles. Um, now they do have them on the strip, on the bridges, because they're a different law than the streets. But they're now trying to make a law to stop people doing it by saying that you can't stand on the bridge for a certain amount of time. And they're saying it's to do with traffic control, but it's really to just get rid of buskers, hmm. you know. I just think, where have we gone as a society where, like, you know, we can't just play in the street, you know, and, and enjoy music, you know, but I can go down this rabbit hole, <laughs> you know, of, of talking. I'm very passionate about things like this. So it's the activist in me. <laughs> You're on mute, Harold. Is there anything you would like to say to uh, people that follow you on um, Instagram, TikTok, um, social oh, media? Yes. Um, just honestly, like if you've got something that you've always wanted to do, <laughs> you know, and you've got in the back of your mind that like, you know, and you're worried about what other people are going to say and you just think, oh, people are going to think I'm stupid. People are just going to think you know oh well that's really not like them or you know something like that you know um just don't just do it just absolutely do it because i honestly never thought that this was like you know just from buying that tin whistle so long ago you know three years ago i never thought that i would be here doing any of this right now and just how many doors have been opened and how much things unfolded it was all from taking a risk um, and trying something out. So I guess like, you know, um, F around and find out. <laughs> it's, uh, it's definitely something that I live by. And it's just not really care what anybody thinks, you know, like we really all need to be individuals in this world. And, uh, you know, we can't let creativity die. You know, we just can't. Um, and I'd love to see more people get creative, especially with um, their craft practices you know, and doing things in an unconventional style, you know, a lot of the, re that's a lot of the reason why I really like Starhawk stuff, because, you know, a lot of her ritual stuff is quite theatrical, um, and it's still very earth-based, it's not ceremonial, um, but it's got that theatrical, like, play side to it, which is what I just love about ritual, you know, so yeah, I would say mm. definitely just, like, get yourself out there, because you just don't know, you know, and also the other thing, is that, you know, when you're doing creative projects and it's really, really hard because we're kind of living in this world where everything's recorded, everything's monitored, you know, that kind of thing. I'm not trying to sound paranoid. It's just like, you know, we, we, we've got our phones with us all the time. And, and when we think of a creative project, we're almost automatically going to, oh, I can put that on the internet, you know, or oh, I can sell, I can make these and I can sell them. Get rid of that step, right? And do the creative stuff for you first. You know, that's what I would say. Do the creative stuff for you and then think about the other thing. Just trust me, like, you know, I think honestly for me, you know, I would rather play a drum circle full of like, you know, all these cool vibes and like people that are like reaching down at earth and just like, you know, having a good time than to maybe like get, I don't know, a residency on the street or something, you know? Like for me, my path is more about like community and including everyone um, in that and just bringing forward um, parts of me that are inside um, how I see the world and also the stories, the stories from the past um, that, you know, that I want to bring forward. Some of my culture from, from where I'm from, um, you know, that a lot of people feel so disconnected, especially, you know, us that are white, feel very disconnected right now. And, you know, there there are some real cool cultural things that I'm from and I just would love to share that with people. So it's kind of a lot of the reason yeah. I do. So how, what's your plan for sharing it more? Are you going to just do it on the stage in your music or are you going to maybe do a podcast? What what do you think would be a great way to get the information out? There's a few things that I'm toying with. I don't really want to say 
too much um but obviously like i've spoken about the bardic circle that's something that you know i have been trying to get people um into and involved in and uh so far like you know a lot of people are like yes we'll totally go if you do it so um you know there's a group of us that are sort of thinking of, of when we're going to put that together um yeah i think music honestly i think after my performance on um at the witchmas party on on thursday i'm probably going to be taking a break till beltane um, just because I have just been through so much with with my husband being sick and then just I mean, I, I had two performances in October after he'd been in intensive care and I still went and did them and I really just haven't had a break this entire time. And so uh, I will probably be going into my own little like um, Yule, uh, you know, drawn inwards kind of attitude of, of just staying in a little bit because not yeah. too much. Hibernating. Oh, yeah, the thing is, you don't want to do it too much because we here in Vegas, you know, we also do hibernate for like two months of the year as well in the summer because it's too hot to do anything. <laughs> yeah, so you kind of it's like it's hot, you know, it's that that line of like you know making sure that you're also making the most of the fact that it's lovely weather. Um, so definitely like um, want to work on more music stuff. Um, I want to start doing covers of very old folk tales, um, as well. There are a few covers that I want to do. Um, but as far as, I mean, there's just a few, few ideas that I've banded around. Um, there's also, um, as far as like, cause like I said, I like to involve activism in with my practice as well. Going to be doing monthly trash cleanups because quite a lot of, um, what I do as well as I, I uh, help out a lot of mutual aid and grassroots organizations here. Um, usually they are indigenous led. Um, so I've actually been doing that longer than I've been pagan. I've actually done that the whole time I've been um, in Las Vegas. I've been involved in like community gardens and stuff like that. And one of the things that I want to do is just start getting like, we just did one, um, but get like a, a monthly trash cleanup going, um, mm -hmm. you know, and invite people from the, the witchcraft community to come and get involved in stuff like that. And we'll always try and do some sort of fundraising for um, a grassroots organization here. That's wonderful. Yeah, I really feel also we need to get back to focusing on healing and protecting um, Mother Earth and the animals. So yeah yes i i, I totally you are doing that agree. yeah and that's honestly why i just out of everyone all the authors and all that starhawk really has just stuck out for me for her continued work in activism um has just been so inspiring to me the earth path if anybody um wants to like really work on putting activism and uh an earth-based spiritual path together especially if you live in a city and you're not very sure on how you could what you can do in a city as far as like working with nature i would definitely recommend the earth path by starhawk definitely well thank you and we have the information of how to contact you scrolling on the bottom instagram and tiktok musical teapot Bandcamp, um, musicalteapot.bandcamp.com, and the email, the musicalteapot at hotmail.com. Thank you so much for having me. I've had a really good time talking You're to you. You're welcome. It is a pleasure. Yes. Thank you for hanging out with us, and it's great to get to know you. Thank you Make so much. you guys much. keep it right here on www.witchcrafttv.online. This is the Lone Wolf Show. I'm the Lone Wolf, and my co host, Monastery and Monarch for Kansas, and my lovely wife, Patricia. Thank you so much for coming on, Teapot. Um, rock on. I hope to hear some better music. I hope to see some more music in the feeds. If I see you, I'll be clicking. And for our viewers, y'all be clicking too. Happy Yule, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> I'll see.